When I get out, I'll get back at coppers and pennies. I'll fight coppers with pennies. Every job I pull will involve pennies. The giant penny in Batman's cave has an interesting history, as does the villain it's initially associated with. From the same tangent that brought you Superman's cape pocket, we have the giant penny. And this penny story, it's actually pretty gruesome. This coin has killed and will kill again. That's why Batman has to keep it there to keep an eye on it. Greetings comic lovers and welcome back to Casually Comics, the channel where we chat all things comics, from reviews comics new and old, to history, to anecdotes, really wherever our whims take us. Today, they take us to the golden age. The giant penny is an iconic piece of Batman and memorabilia. It's up there with the dinosaur and the Joker card. But for some, the question was, where did he get that giant penny from? It's just kind of there. This is a question that has an answer. Multiple answers, because it's changed. The penny has been retconned. Let's start at the beginning with the first sighting of the giant penny. The first giant penny sighting. And that is from World's Finest number 30. This in the year 1947. While World's Finest, which initially ran from 1941 to 1986, would become a Batman Superman team up comic, it started off as an anthology book. That while, yes, it did have Batman, Superman, and usually Robin doing something together on the cover, inside there were individual stories featuring these characters and a host of others, including Johnny Everyman. I just like to say Johnny Everyman. The first issue where they appear together is issue 71 in 1954. The Batman story is the last story in this comic, despite being advertised as the second in the index. In reality, they bookend this issue. Maybe they're listed in order of importance. If so, I'm sorry, Johnny Everyman. The story was written by Bill Finger with art by Bob Kane, inking by Ray Burnley, and lettering by Ira Schnapp. It's called The Penny Plunderer and may feature one of the most dramatic villains out there, and that's saying something. The giant penny features on the teaser page, stopping the dynamic duo from being shot by our villain and his henchmen. One of the most common of all objects is a penny. Yes, just your ordinary one cent penny. All of us, rich or poor, use pennies. Whether it be for a newspaper or a bit of candy and never given it a thought, but it was not so with Joe Coyne. He thought about pennies all the time. To him, a penny was a symbol. Of crime. crime! You can tell that Joe Coyne is going to be special. There was actually a late 19th, early 20th century vaudevillian actor by that name. But from what I could see of his career, it didn't seem to be a direct reference. It's much more likely they were just going for a punny name. Because he's into pennies, so he needs a coin themed name. Why not just go with coin? Cut out the middleman. Because his parents are penniless, young Joe Coyne sells papers and does a business in pennies. Pennies. Other guys have big bills like ones, but I've got pennies. But wait till I grow up. Grow up? He's drawn so he looks about 35 in these panels. But when he does grow up, he's caught gambling on the job with pennies. Choosing the path taken by weak fools, Coin turns to crime, but is arrested on his first try. And the register only has pennies in it, which the cop arresting him mocks him for. Listen, you can buy a lot of candy with those pennies. The teaser page told me so. Pennies and coppers, they did this to me. Pennies, coppers, cop pennies. I hate them all. When I get out, I'll get back at coppers and pennies. I'll fight coppers with pennies. Every job I pull will involve pennies. My crime symbol will be pennies. I think Joe actually put more thought into his symbol than Bruce. I mean, a bat just flew through his window. This has a whole backstory. The level of melodrama is off the charts. It also looks like he's yelling all this through the bars, but this rant is all happening in a thought bubble. Coin serves his time, but when he gets out, it's straight to get some henchmen. He sells them on the idea by saying that they're going to work with pennies, but make millions. They're going to do some great and wise investing in the stock market. No, of course not. They're going to do things like rob a bank by pretending to be bringing a roll of pennies for exchange, then wham, tear gas. Next is the kidnapping of a rare collection of antique penny banks. And yes, that is an actual other name for a piggy bank. So is Moneybox. And they found them as far back as the second century BC or BCE. All these penny crimes make the papers. It's probably some sort of mania. Well, you would know. Bruce also names him the Penny Plunderer, which is a fine alliteration, just grand. There's an exhibit coming that's gonna have some rare coins and stamps. And so Bruce figures that the Penny Plunderer won't be able to resist. And thank goodness this exhibit is coming because pennies are quite the niche. It's at this exhibit where we see the giant coin within the story. And Coin just throws coins into the air as a distraction for the crowd. And by coins, I of course mean pennies. That would hurt a lot. The next panel just says the crowd was distracted, but ouch. Also they need to gather all those pennies so they can buy some newspapers to read about what happened. The giant penny's role in this is Batman rolling it towards the penny plunderer, who manages to dodge it, but his henchman Skinny isn't so lucky. Wait, that isn't Skinny. That's Mike. This panel calls Batman an acro Batman, and that's fantastic. Somehow Skinny gets captured, and Joe Coyne isn't sure that he's not gonna be ratted out, which he is, and Joe kills him. Penny crime is way more hardcore than nickel and dime operations. Skinny, I'm worried about your health losing weight. Let's see, and you'll get your fortune too. It ain't good. Your future is very dark. The future is always dark. For stool pigeons! I don't know which is the better detail, that this machine cost a penny, 
or the fact that he got this machine and then went through it and put the special fortune in there just for skinny. He just loves a dramatic moment. And he shoots him dead at a penny arcade, which is also his hideout. Fantastic. Batman and Robin show up and find skinny with a penny on his lips. Batman says it's a gang thing. A uh, stoolie's life is not worth a copper penny when he squeals to a copper. Was this a thing? I've never heard that before and wasn't able to find any references to it. If you know, please tell me because I want to know the appropriate way to handle stool pigeons because snitches get stitches. I've heard of pennies on the eyes before. I was surprised they were on his eyes. Anyway, they fight in this arcade and it's fun. Batman even yells tilt as he kicks what looks like a pinball machine. Joe Coin knocks Batman out by punching him while holding a roll of pennies. He ties them up, takes their utility belts and cuts the phone lines and says his boys are on the way. Come on, Joe, pass the ultimate test. Show the world that you can kill a man with just one penny. But Joe Coin didn't take the spice out of the room because he didn't read Dune because he couldn't because it wasn't written yet. So he didn't know that he who controls the spice controls the universe. There's salt in that spice box. And so Batman is able to use them and the two pennies plus the cut wire and some water to make a miniature battery. This is because one of the pennies is a copper penny, but the other one is a zinc steel penny. It was a special war issue penny that was issued in 1943. It's a neat detail. Those pennies, there weren't that many of them. By 1945, they were using gilding metal. And by 1947, when this comic came out, bronze, both of which have a high copper content. American pennies time recording are copper painted zinc. Canadian pennies, non-existent. <laughs> Withdrawn from circulation in 2013, but technically the ones that are still around are still legal tender. But to avoid ever letting people use them, bills are rounded. That's your random Canadian fact for the day. <laughs> They're able to make a Morse code call and get rescued by the police, just in time to stop the penny plunderer from stealing all the pennies at this millionaire's yacht party, where he's having all these penny arcade machines brought so that the guests can play them on board. That actually sounds super fun. Also, it's clever. Coin had rigged the machines, which he had sent to the party when they were ordered through the penny arcade. So he was actually operating it. And then he used this inside info to install gas inside the specific machines. You know, the penny plunderer is demonstrating a lot of effort. He's really dedicated to this gimmick and it makes the story more enjoyable because despite everything, he's making it work. Look out, vintage bat plane. Coin ends up on the run and barricades himself in a room in a warehouse. But the room has a payphone. Huzzah, he'll call the boys. But he only has pennies. It's a payphone, I'll need five cents. Coin's hand comes out of his pocket with all the coins he is carrying. Five cents, but in pennies. No! It's a payphone, I need a single nickel to be able to dial. No! You can put pretty much anything a quarter or lower in now, if you can find one. There are strong reasons for keeping them around, but we've had enough tangents this video. So Coin is captured. And later, it is ironical that the end of the Penny Plunderer can be so easily learned by so many for just a few pennies. This story is far better than it has any right to be. The drama, the pathos, the intricate planning on Joe Coyne's part, and it's fun. This story is a dime a d Scrap it, let it go, it's not working. <laughs> <laughs> too far. You may have noticed that Batman never actually acquired the penny in this story, but eventually going forward, it just manifests in the Batcave. The assumption he made is, oh, well, he must have got it after the museum job. They were just so grateful, I guess. Here, take this giant coin as a token. I imagine Batman gets some odd gifts. But the coin's journey was not done, nor was the penny plunderers. In 1966, also in World's Finest, this time in issue 163, the origin is briefly given as something he got from one of the Joker's crimes, which he names the Joker's bad penny crimes. But the coin would eventually come to be associated with a villain far more known for coins, and that's Two-Face. Two-Face has very few appearances in the Gold and Silver Ages. In the Golden Age, he just didn't seem to land and even went through a name change. He was once called Harvey Kent. I like to imagine there's an alternate universe where he's related to Clark. In the Silver Age, he was deemed too violent and not kid-friendly or code appropriate. It was in 1971 when the Comics Code was revised and loosened that he would be brought back by Dennis O'Neill and he would become the prominent member of Batman's rogue gallery that he is known as today. The coin had been a background feature for so long that some just assumed that it had to have something to do with Two-Face, as some had forgotten the Penny Plunderer. His story had been reprinted, but infrequently. And in 1987, it was firmly associated with Two-Face. In Batman 410, in the story Two of a Kind. Just some casual Jason threatening on the cover, it's fine. I'm sure nothing serious will ever happen to Jason. This story is a training story for Bruce and Jason. It even includes that panel where you see Bruce training Jason how to use a gun. It's during this training session when Jason asks, what's the deal with the giant coin? Just a little memento, Jason. A certain party tried to crush Robin and me under it. But we double crossed him. That was a pun. Don't think I didn't notice that, Bruce. Jason then identifies the coin as a giant replica of the one Two Face is flipping, which isn't actually true. In Two Face's origin, it gets really specific about him scratching up a silver dollar. This is also the issue where Jason roasts Two Face's car. Here's my customized two door. 
How do you like it? It's too much. That's too much, man. <laughs> Who is doing all this custom work for Two-Face? Asking for a friend. The 90s Batman animated series episode Almost Got Him from 1992 would also utilize Two-Face as the origin of the giant coin. It is in the segment detailing how Two-Face almost took out Batman, where he ties Batman to the coin in an elaborate death trap, where the coin will be flipped and then Batman will be smushed, which obviously did not happen. And instead, Two-Face ends up under the coin and Batman gets to keep it, which Two-Face is very salty about. So Harvey, what became of the giant Benny? They actually let him keep it. It's just one line, but it makes a big difference. But the coin was not done its journey. In the comic realm, it would once again find itself associated with the Penny Plunderer, who would come back, sort of. He returns in an outing that chooses to retell the Golden Age story of his origin. This is in Batman Chronicles issue 19 from 1999, in a story by Graham Nolan, who also did the art, with colors by Noel Giddings and lettering by John Costanza. Batman Chronicles was a title that ran quarterly from 1995 to 2001. It was a series of stories set in the Batman universe, usually with at least one featuring Batman. The others would be his supporting cast and villains, which is the case with this tale, the 90s Penny Plunderer. Let's go. It starts off with coins seemingly in a jail cell recounting how he came to this place. Look, I'm innocent. I didn't do nothing. Lies. Own it like your Golden Age counterpart. It's the Penny's fault. Pennies are responsible for all of life's problems. I just had some bad breaks is all. This version expands upon his backstory a little bit. Instead of selling newspapers and resenting being poor, Coin comes from a troubled home where he's constantly told he won't amount to anything. Alas, they miss the opportunities to say things like he'll never add up to two cents or no one wants to hear his two cents. Instead, his dad calls him small change. Hey, small change, give me another beer. They still do him trying to rob the store that only has pennies in the till, and this time both the cop and the store clerk laugh at him. This time he went to juvie, and instead it's an attempted bank job that sends him to prison, where we do get an almost line for line redo of the pennies and copper speech, and this time he's yelling it, not just thinking it. It's a bit sad that it's not exactly line for line. There was some clever wordplay going on in the original one. This one goes as follows. But I'll get even. When I get out of here, I won't avoid coins and pennies anymore. Instead, I'll embrace my destiny and use them as my symbols of crime. Bit melodramatic, don't you think, coin? And what's wrong with that, judgmental questioner? And nobody said anything about that penguin guy and his kooky crime bird at the puzzle dude. What's his name? The puzzler. Clue master. The Riddler. Poor puzzler. Always the bridesmaid, never the main villain. So Joe starts pulling bigger crimes, but they're not strictly penny themed, and we only see a recreation of the bank robbery from the Golden Age story, where he uses the I need to change some pennies trick again, but robs the place. Then we're on to the big coin. This time his name, the Penny Plunderer, is given to him by the press because he was so successful at pinching pennies. Hey -o! This time the giant penny is a device he builds with his henchmen as a Trojan horse so they can sneak into the museum exhibit and steal the world's most expensive stamp, which is also what they were trying to do in the original. Instead he just threw some coins into the crowd. This is more elaborate and you do buy that he would have to try a bit harder to get into this exhibit and not be able to just walk in, especially if he was so well known. It's not like he has a disguise or anything. It also does make the coin a bit more focal to the crime. They bust out to steal all these rare stamps and coins. Coppers, I was having my revenge. Coin was finally gonna be Rich, he was gonna do it. Cons. But Batman shows up and they fight. And for some reason, the interrogator gets really judgmental about the fact that Coin hits Robin. So you hit the kid, tough guy. Um, take that up with Batman. Everybody tries to hit Robin. As Coin flees, Batman throws some change at him. So Coin wildly shoots his gun, severing the line holding up the giant stamp, which hits the coin and sends it creating towards Joe. In this panel, he's dead. <laughs> he dies. He died hard. This story does not operate by Saturday morning cartoon logic, and when that coin comes down, it crushes him. The person interrogating him is Satan. He's in hell. This story took place in hell. <laughs> <laughs> Recognize him? No. Just another thief, I guess. Another penny anti thief. Hmm. I love this coin, Robin. Wash the blood off. We'll take it to the back cave. Why? This story is very vicious. It's kind of mean spirited towards the penny plunderer. It goes very, very hard. Updating the story can be interesting, and there are some changes that do improve the story, but overall, not really, and instead, most of them rob the story of the initial charm it had. The original story, while very tropey and by modern standards silly, was very coherent to its own logic. It took itself seriously in how it was constructed and presented itself, but there was care there and thought and some tongue in cheekedness that made it fun. It was intense intentionally funny at points, but it also had the character pull off some interesting schemes and Batman had to be clever to get out of them. This story removes those lighthearted elements and it takes it in a much more serious direction, with the humor that remains taking a much darker tone. It goes full gritty backstory and in doing so it ends up making it even sillier and making you focus on elements such as his nickname and the like, and it's not helped by the narrator constantly belittling and lambasting him. It takes those silly elements that were at first presented as more fun and presents them in a more derogatory manner. It can read or come 
across as though this story is ashamed of the Golden Age one or trying to justify it, implying that that original story was just too silly and kiddish, and this is hardcore, it's extreme with an X. The fact that the story ends up brutally killing the character and having Batman not even know who he is, it's meant to be a dark joke and a whole guess what, he wasn't even worth a penny. But the irony in quotes in this story doesn't land as well because it doesn't come full circle like it did in the Golden Age one with the newspaper. Instead, it just comes across as a bit mean-spirited if you know the original story, and as a random tale if one doesn't. It can also cause some confusion of, hey wait, I thought Two-Face gave the coin. Not that he got off of this corpse. The story itself is fine and coherently put together, it's just not overly memorable. It's one you've seen before, but as an update it falls into the but, but why, why though category. Not everything needs a gritty update. It's most likely just meant to be a macabre joke, and for some it may work well on that level. The update on his looks was good. It was in keeping but modernized. That worked well. So that's the end, right? It has to be. Coin's dead. No, there's more. The origin of the coin would be retconned again, this time to a version that would involve both Two-Face and Joe Coin, because this was the hole in canon that needed plugging. I mean, I couldn't read Batman again until they solved this. Who actually gave him his coin, DC? Who? Enter Two-Face Year 2, specifically Issue 2 from 2008. This one is written by Mark Sable, with art by Jesus Saiz and Jeremy Hahn. Inks by Jimmy Palmiotti, Jeremy Hahn, and Chris Chuckery, who also did the colors, lettering by Sal Cipriano. This story is an update on Two-Face's origins, Year 1 style. So in this tale, Coin is just kind of there. In the middle of Two-Face's crime and revenge spree, we just cut to Coin. He's robbing a bank. This bank has a giant penny suspended from the ceiling as a novelty item. Give me all your money, but I want it all in. Change. I've been telling the people of Gotham. That's what they needed for a long time. At last, the meeting we'd always dreamt of. Two-Face says he's only there because he wants the Maroni, Falcone, and Bertinelli accounts. Coin can have the rest. I want to know why all these crime families are banking at the same branch. Coin does not appreciate this and says that Two-Face should have cleared it with the Penguin, implying that he's more of a two-bit hoodlum in this universe because he has to clear his crime with the Penguin first. Man, Two-Face's henchmen's costumes are unfortunate. In this story, Batman at least knows who the Penny Plunderer is. He jumps in and tells them to lower their weapons. The Penny Plunderer is doing so, but Two-Face proclaims that it's Batman and he's responsible for all the freaks. So he shoots the rope holding the giant penny. He does not flip a coin before doing this because... I guess it's inevitable. The coin lands in such a way that it rolls, even crashing out the window towards the GCPD. Wow, so this bank had a real giant heavy coin up there, not some hollow plastic thing. I'm surprised. Batman stops the coin, saying Two-Face got away, but the coin crushed and killed the Penny Plunderer. The modern era is not a good time to be the Penny Plunderer. And again, I guess they just let him keep that coin. Why not? Because later in the issue, you see it in his Batcave. You see, by answering this question, in some ways they've raised more. In these two comic updates, the coin killed coin. Why does he want it? What is it reminding him of? Of. Is it just because it's a huge novelty coin? Probably. Giant things are cool. And that is the latest update on coin suffering. Time of recording. The latest update also suffers a bit from, but why though? Coin does not need to be in the story at all, and once more he's unceremoniously killed. This one feels like more of a reference though, a nod to past canon, a kind of acknowledgement that the giant penny originally came from coin. So it does fuse the two origins together, which does tie up a continuity error, which for many may not have been a big deal in the first place. More of a bit of trivia or a fun inconsistency to point out out as some enjoy tracking such things, not in a malicious manner, but in a taking pride in observing such small details. Though of course some do get overly pedantic, and some can hyper-focus on inconsistencies. Then for the heck of it, the New 52 in 2011 decided to associate the giant penny with an arc featuring the Riddler. During the Batman Zero Year arc, the penny is introduced as an art piece in front of Wayne Enterprises for symbolism. And then later, Lucius Fox uses it to tech the tech, boost their radio signals, and jam the Riddler, go through his jammers. And then you don't see it, but then it appears in the Batcave, so the assumption is that Bruce kept it. It is nice to see the penny be useful, but it doesn't have to be that deep. It can be, but it can also just be a giant novelty coin. From Joe Coin to Two-Face to the Riddler. An interesting trajectory. The question of where Batman got his giant penny from is a fun one to ponder, but ultimately not a question that urgently needs resolving. Of the tellings, when it comes to how the penny got into the cave, the animated series episode takes the crown. It's short, the coin plays an integral part into the actual crime taking place, and it's still tied to a coin-based villain, even if it's not the original one. And it also makes the connection of how Batman got to keep it. Of the comic stories, story-wise, the Golden Age one is the most enjoyable. It goes so hard into the concept of pennies that it just stays 
stays with you. Coin works well as a one and done gimmick. It is a very specific thing. So by utilizing it only once, it doesn't wear out its welcome and you can follow the logic of keeping the big penny. How often are you gonna fight a villain dedicated to pennies who got captured because he didn't have a nickel? Amazing. The Golden Age story gives the concept as much weight as it needs, which is not that much, while still treating it like a proper story and not a farce. The other stories take the concept a bit too seriously. It's one of those interesting things where it's an idea that if you try and take it too seriously, it makes it sillier than it already initially was. Ultimately, while this is a fun question to answer, it can take some odd turns when it's steered away from lighthearted musing. And sometimes it's just more fun to ponder a question than to actually have the answer. Hello, hi, it's me from the future. I was deep into editing this and I fell behind and so I posted a teaser of one of the snippets from the issue and some of you had some jokes that were so good that I had to insert them because they made me laugh and I wanted to share with the class. In regards to the crime spree of Joe Coin, we have Today he's known as the Bitcoin Bandit. This coin has definitely flipped. And I vow to get back at everyone and to get back at everyone with nickels. Yes, nickels. I will be. Nickelback. Never made it as a villain. Couldn't cut it in Gotham City. Coin, I'm going to do crime one cent at a time. It'll be the crime of the century. That one, I feel like I should have made that one myself. I feel disappointed in myself for not getting that one. Well, you know what they say, in for a penny, in for a pounding. That sounds either like something the Joker would say or something the Triple X parody would say. Take your pick. And yes, I just, I had to share those with you. There you go. <laughs> So that is the story of Joe Coin, the Penny Plunderer, and how Batman got his giant penny. What did you think? Which was your favorite? More lighthearted or the coin should have killed more people? Full darkness, he made Robin clean the blood off the coin with his tongue. Sorry, that went full all-star Batman and Robin there for a minute. Has there ever been an obscure question that you wanted answered in canon, and then when the answer came, you would have preferred that it hadn't? Are there any obscure things you'd like to chat about? Let me know down below. While you're down there, please do all the YouTube things. Like, share, comment, subscribe, and hit the bell notification so that you never miss a vid. Thanks so much for taking this our day spent discussing comics with me. I always appreciate it, and I will see you again soon. Bye-bye. P.S. Do you like my shirt? It is a Whim City shirt. It's actually a Whim City Crop top, crop hoodie. Uh, if you like it, I have a link below. <laughs>